Hi, welcome to the Indie Wine Podcast, episode 47. My name is Matt Wood, and today we'll be hearing from James Jelks of Flores Wines. James is a super thoughtful winemaker. His wines are full of uniqueness and personality. Most are made in a zero-zero fashion from the converted apple warehouse he shares with Margins Wines in Watsonville. He works with mostly Santa Cruz Mountains fruit, as well as some from neighboring San Benito and Santa Clara counties, and even up into Sonoma and Mendocino. Here we go. So you, you grew up in uh, Santa Cruz? I grew up in Davis, in California. Davis, okay. Yeah, a little bit of a... Sometimes your story gets... Well, your story's told, but as it goes through the grapevine, the story can change a little bit. Yeah. But I was born in Santa Cruz, Okay. so that would make sense how people... That little uh, other avenue got taken. But yeah, I was born in Santa Cruz, and then I grew up in Davis, California. Okay. And then I moved back to Santa Cruz in 2017 when I started working here and making wine for the first year for my own brand. How did you originally get into wine? What was Yeah, so a little bit by virtue of being in Davis, California. Um, My family was always a food-oriented family. I wouldn't say necessarily like wine family. They enjoyed wine, um, but they weren't nerdy about it or not necessarily extravagant in their purchasing or pursuit of wine. And sometimes I joke that you know, I was almost bred to be a winemaker because my dad comes from an agricultural background. Okay. And so he had an organic farm in Cape Valley, um, came from a ranching family in Arizona. And then my mom was a research scientist and uh, did her PhD and research at UC Davis. Okay. And so kind of you got the agricultural background, scientific background, they blend pretty well. Yeah. And then being in Davis, um, they there's the Enology and Viticulture program at UC Davis. Mm-hmm also proximity to Sonoma and Napa. And I got into wine a little bit as a, I was graduating high school and I wanted to travel abroad. Okay. And I wanted to go to Europe, but I wasn't necessarily gonna be gifted a backpack and money. Uh, Since my mom was at the university, she encouraged me to look at the UC systems summer abroad programs. Mm. Um, cause I was already committed to going to UC Santa Barbara for aquatic biology. So I was within the UC system. Um, and you know, there was architecture in Spain or food and culture in Italy, but there was also winemaking in France Oh, wow. and that caught my attention. And, uh, so I went to Burgundy, France as an 18 year old and got right into it. Um, not a bad place to get into wine. Yeah. Was that sort of a harvest helper kind of So it was job? a U- UC Davis introduction to winemaking. So it was oh, a, a so was one month program. Course, it was okay. a course. And uh, I had done the math. It's been a while, but I think we visited like 20 some wineries in a month period. I think 24 wineries in like one month. We'd taste pretty much every day mm-hmm. after class at 11 a.m. And yeah, I was partnered with the University of Dijon. Okay. Yeah, that was a... Basically, I also often bring up just like my own personal interests. When I was in high school, I was a bit of a esoteric hobbyist. Okay. Everything from gardening to fixing mopeds and bikes to saltwater aquariums and keeping and breeding poison dart frogs. Okay. Which that story gets repeated of mine. <laughs> but the point I bring that up, it's like childhood interests. That being said, it kind of showcases my nature. Um, just I like tinkering. I like husbandry of plants and animals. Yeah. And when I went... um, and saw winemaking, there's the horticulture of the vineyards, the engineering and mechanics of the winery, and of course, like the alchemy and magic of winemaking and um, vintning. So that all spoke to my interests and uh, that set the hook. And then it was really through reading because I was underaged in the States. I kept that interest going by reading a lot. Okay. Um, And of course, you know, getting friends to maybe get me some bottles at Trader Joe's and taking <laughs> notes because we all start somewhere. Yeah. Um, but the the hook had been set. And then at some point it just clicked while I was reading a book. It's like, this is what I want to do. This is what I'm going to do. So I transferred from UC Santa Barbara to UC Davis. Um, and I did finish my undergrad in analogy and viticulture and then started working for people um, 2012 and never looked back. Started my own production in 2017. And yeah, it's been a long, it's yeah, it's from 2009 until now. So it's been a long uh, passion pursuit of mine. What was that book that kind of set the hook finally? Yeah, I mean, I haven't read it since like way back when. So I can't, uh, I should reread it, but it was Corkscrewed by Robert Camuto. Okay. And um, it introduced, also it, it was honestly the reason I also 
probably began to discover natural wine at the time because it brought up the concept of like the vigneron, um, mm. biodynamic farming, native yeast. And uh, that definitely set me down an interest path of, you know, what is authentic wine? What is like traditionally made old world wine? Mm -hmm. And that also has dictated, you know, my pursuits in my own winemaking. Going into UC Davis, did you know you wanted to kind of take the natural wine? Yeah, path pretty much. A big people interest? people would like almost tease me, like, "Oh, like James likes wines with the VA, okay. or like <laughs> hippie winemaker." And I mean, I'm not as fringe as some, but I definitely was um, interested in a more naturalistic pathway. Um, working with native yeast, organic fruit, all that stuff was pretty um, made sense to me. Yeah, like they'd been doing it like that for so long, it seemed possible, and why not? But yeah, I was always interested in that path. What did UC Davis provide you that you were able to kind of loop in with that natural side of yeah. winemaking? Yeah, I think that's a good point to bring up because a lot of people sometimes in the natural wine community can almost like poo-poo the education, like wanting yeah. the strictly like avant-garde art winemaker. And that's fine. Like I, you can do that and I respect that as well. But that being said, like I think the foundation um, – the deeper understanding of what's going on, like s specifically microbiology was a big one, mm. like understanding what's going on and like why a fermentation might show certain characters or have issues. Mm -hmm. And that's where you can learn by doing for sure, but having a like the fundamental building blocks of a classic education, I wouldn't trade for anything. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, they give you, and they, they say this too, but like they give you a toolkit and it's like up to you to apply it. I'll admit, like, yeah, I definitely started more conservatively and have gotten, um, you know, not extremist, but yeah, more fringe in my winemaking mm -hmm. as I've grown more confident with it. But they can produce a little bit of a conservative winemaker because, you know, they're talking about issues and, you know, how to address them and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, not that you unlearn it, but through experience and honestly, yeah, like working with all the other young winemakers pursuing this who have worked around, having seen so many different things, you start to realize um, it's actually very possible to make natural wines. Mm -hmm. Sure, there's like inherent risks and things that can happen along the way, but I, I learned over the first few years, especially that like wine is, um, it's more robust than maybe it's mm -hmm. made out to be. Right. You know, it's like, oh, the wine's gonna turn into vinegar. Like I've never had a wine truly turn into vinegar. Sure, there's been like volatility issues here and there, but yeah. you know, like I've never, seen something turn into vinegar, mm -hmm. you know? Um, you did a little traveling after UC Davis, right? Yeah. Back so to, back to France. Yep. I had worked a couple harvests in California and, but my heart, you know, when I got into wine, started in Burgundy, France. So there was definitely um, an interest in European winemaking. So I was pretty hell bent on going to France and um, I, I really wanted the, uh, there was a scholarship with the Cheval, um, Confrérie. Uh, oh, Confrérie de, de Tostigon, the, the yeah, Chevalier yeah, yeah. de Tostigon. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that was always like very, very competitive. I never landed that scholarship, okay. um, but I applied to a bunch of places and I had met uh, somebody who was repping the Louis Latour wines mm. in California. And so I was able to work a harvest at Maison Louis Latour in Alux Corton okay. in 2014. And then, yeah, kind of did the little travel circuit, went down to Australia after that. Actually did get a uh, scholarship for that, the Doug Weiser Memorial Scholarship at Craggy Range okay, um, in Hawke's Bay, New Zealand. Then I went to Oregon at Beaufrere in the Willamette Valley. And then mm -hmm. I went down to Australia at a really small kind of boot or kind of they're a little bit of like a cult winery called uh, Wendery. Mm, mm -hmm. Not many people have heard of it because it's not exported. I think it was exported for okay. a small amount of time to California. Um, what do they make there generally? So it's in the Clare Valley, which okay. is known for Riesling, but they really make old vine dry farmed reds. Okay. So I, I don't, I can't remember what you know critic put the name on it, but you know the, the Iron Hand in a velvet glove type mm, of wines, yeah, like very refined, but you know pretty. Powerful wines, not over the top, not like big fifteen percenters, but okay, um, yeah, solid reds. What were some of the things you kind of took from seeing maybe the same grape made in a few different regions, or just different harvest internships, and like what any of those things that you kind of took with you and 
you're still still using in your winemaking today? Yeah, for sure. Um, you definitely, the beauty of working for lots of different people is you pick up bits and pieces along the way of what you like, and then you can apply it towards your project. Um, I think I, I have trundled down my own path a little bit, yeah. you know, like um, That's I've, fine, yeah. I've pursued, I guess, honestly, like what my imagination wanted, which is okay. uh, this very minimalist style of winemaking, kind of how I imagined like very old world wine to be made. Mm. I think we all have this kind of romanticism that, you know, wine is made in a crusty little moldy cellar <laughs> um, with beautiful grapes. And some of the, I loved all the places I worked. Some of them were a little bit of a larger setting. Um, I, I love that there's room for everybody. Um, I took away the bits and pieces from all the places I want, but I pursued how I imagined like I wanted wine to be made. Mm-hmm. Um what I thought or believed was possible. When you're looking at your uh, macro bin of grapes, what's going through your your mind when once you get them into the winery here? Um, so definitely paying attention to the nose, like when you're going native. Um, obviously assessing fruit quality, um, but those first couple days are always c- kind of exciting and nerve wracking at the same time. But you're looking at the you're kind of watching the evolution of the different yeasts and bacteria that are coming through. Mm. So you pretty much always will get like a slight phase of ethyl acetate coming from some of the wild yeast, probably Hansenia sporia or uh, Pickia yeasts. And then those kind of fall away once there's a little bit of alcohol. And you really, I'm definitely queuing in and paying attention, looking for that Saccharomyces population to kick in, okay. more of the yeasty aromas. And then also then beginning to respond to each phase of that in the winemaking and starting to like realize, okay, they're kicking off. Let's start to pay a little more attention to it. Maybe give it some pump overs, try and introduce a little bit of oxygen, get that population super happy and healthy. Um, And then, yeah, I think that's also one of the beauties of working naturally is kind of learning how to help the ferment along the way. Mm. Um, And if different odors or things come along, how do you respond to that? You know, maybe the ferment starts to slow down a little bit and you're like, okay, like maybe needs a little more warmth. Um, You might take it out into the sun or put it in a little warmer of a spot of the cellar. And yeah, so I think just tracking the, once the, once the grapes are in the vat, um, really tracking that evolution of the fermentation and keeping it as healthy as possible. Mm -hmm. Of course, things can happen along the way, but, um, I always like things. You, you like things when go when things go well, you know. Yeah, that's always a good sign. Because also, I, I find that you know, if a wine is, if the primary fermentation goes well, you typically things typically age well. Mm. If you like, if there's issues early on, those are typically the wines that are troubled later. Okay. Um, like if you have volatil- volatilities early on, like at that, that's like. I've seen it creep in barrel, but typically if there's like a big issue, it's it's during that primary fermentation. So that is like a really exciting part of the process is getting the fruit, um, bringing it into the wines and getting it into the tank and then encouraging it, you know, shepherding it along the way mm-hmm. to be happy and healthy. Yeah. And so that's like the, you, yeah, the most important part is of course the fruit, um, kind of like cooking. It's like the quality of ingredients is the most important part. And then after that though, you have to like, you have to have good execution in the kitchen mm-hmm. and that's, you know, vinification. And so I do love vinification and taking care of the ferments, tracking them. Um, and if your job's done well there, pretty much your job's not done, but once things are in barrel, like my style of winemaking, then it's pretty hands off. Okay. Um, I have sort of a philosophy to not agitate things after that point. Mm. Um, just, I think people hear winemaking, it's like, okay, making, you got to do something to it. And I think that's a little bit of a folly in a way. Like you you don't need to fiddle with it much after that. Um, At least from what I've seen and just my personal take on it, I like to leave things surly in barrel topped up and and then like don't fuss with it, rack once and bottle. It's kind of simple. Um, And what maybe defines my style, I try not to be too extractive during the vinification, but definitely taking care of the ferment and then get it in barrel, surly, and yeah, minimal agitation, minimal movements. I think that every time you move a wine, it kind of can eat away at it. Um, mm. 
Mind you, the the more robust wines can handle it more, and sometimes maybe something needs air. But I like to work with lighter varieties and make a lighter style, so I typically am not combating like huge tannic wines. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a couple of them, but I still try and move things minimally. Um, and I think yeah, minimal movement, surly aging, topping, and keep it minimal. That's sort of what defines my. My personal philosophy on wine. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It sounds like you try to just get ahead of any issues that might pop up. Yeah. With, I, the, with the ferment or. Yeah. I think kind of to repeat a little bit, but yeah, a healthy primary typically sets the the runway for a solid wine. Okay. And so that's an important part for me. Yeah. Does your, uh, your, your mom's like science side come out during that process, you think? Um, Actually, not excessively in the sense that it's become more of an intuitive process at this point. I guess it's all in there, right? Yeah. Like the science side of understanding the the cascade and evolution of all these microbiomes, um, that's in my head. It's become a little more intuitive at this point, though, uh, just like tracking by smell. I guess it is all related, though, right? I just like now I'm just acting on what to do. I guess I'm not thinking about it as much as I used to. I guess maybe some more chemistry stuff you can think about in developing a style of a wine. Like I did make a Cabernet um, and I intentionally did like a very long maceration, like 30 day maceration with the concept of, you know, having those tannins build and actually soften the wine. Mm -hmm. Um, How successful it was? I'm not sure. 30 day (laughs) maceration, it's still pretty structured. (laughs) Yeah. Um, but playing with some of those concepts and ideas, they do go through my head. Um, but I think of this process is a little more of an intuitive approach and it's fermentation. You're just, you're working with like a, a living organism and trying to keep it happy and healthy. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I yeah, think just- a lot of people have experienced it, whether people are doing like kombucha brewing at home or um, sourdough starter culture, sure. like watching, you know, you feed it, you watch it grow, you watch it collapse. Like that's, I mean, it's fermentation and I guess the be- the beauty and fun of winemaking and all these fermentation processes and going down the natural process, uh, the natural pathways, learning how to kind of uh, see those patterns, recognize where things are right and maybe where things are askew. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, like helping it back to health, like if needed um, or just helping it along the way. But sometimes things go flawlessly. Other times, meh, maybe yeah. a little <laughs> less so, but we embrace that as well. It seems like you've, backed off your sulfur usage over over time. Mm-hmm. Um, not that you ever use a lot, but it just seems like it's been dialed yeah. down kind of every year maybe. Um, is that, I guess it's probably more confidence and just knowing, knowing more, but um, do you base it on like each cuvee kind of, or is there a certain wine that always gets it? How, how are you making that decision? Yeah, so initially started out a little more conservatively, you know, the the overworried mother hen. Um, so like everything got a touch and we're talking, you know, 20 parts or 30 parts at bottling in my first vintage of 2017. 2018, you know, decided to take a little more risk. So through three cuvées got, um, yeah, 20 parts and two cuvées, I did my first sans wines. And maybe I got lucky, but they... Um, they stayed sound. Mm-hmm. I didn't have any issues during fermentation or post bottling, um, and that was the Shangri La Mendo Savvy B and the Free Solo. And Free Solo mm-hmm. also like a lot of the wine names have Easter eggs to them. Not well, maybe it's obvious sometimes, but Free Solo. If the anyone's seen the climbing film, it's yeah. like climbing without ropes. That's why I called it Free Solo because there was no ropes attached, no like safety blanket of sulfur. Um, and yeah, it went well. And then 2019, maybe added a few more sans souf cuvées. And yeah, so every year as I built confidence in it, um, you start to realize more and more, oh, this is possible. Mm-hmm. And I feel like one of the things I kind of repeat is, uh, you know, it's probably easier than ever to do it. Like our ability to clean things and maintain hygiene in the winery is easier than it's ever been. Mm-hmm. Like we're not underground in a cellar with like buckets of cold water. <laughs> <laughs> um We've got a hot pressure washer. We've got a steamer. um, And those are all like very valuable in keeping a clean environment um, and keeping some of the maybe more festering things at bay. Yeah. 
So I think it's easier than ever. That being said, it's still not without mistakes. And I've had wines that, you know, I've sent to distillation because it was just excessively volatile. I'm like, okay, this just isn't going to work. Mm-hmm. Um, I've had wines that I thought were stable post bottling, then go mousy. Um, and I guess I, you know, there's some concern with, uh, you know, quality control out there. And yeah, it's kind of, I was like definitely very worried about, okay, like I've sold this wine, like it's now showing this character like six months later. Mm. Like, uh, what do I do about that? But again, if people are interested in, you know, the fringe fully natural wines, there does need to be a little bit of embrace for that. And different communities behave differently about it. You know, I've heard of some countries that have, their foods have umami flavors, like, you know, enjoying mouse. Mm -hmm. For them, it can go with certain foods. Um, I mean, some food products too can just inherently have mouse. Like you probably tasted it in kombucha or kimchi. Often yeah. it's there. Mm-hmm. Um, and like, yes, small amounts. I I personally don't love it, but small amounts don't bother me. If it if it's detrimental though to the experience, then that's a little too much for me. Okay. Um, but if the, yeah, if there's kind of a, a good window, we were talking about this earlier in the cellar when yeah. we were being interrupted. But if there's an open drinking window, of, you know, four to six hours. That for me is okay. I think that maybe we could actually increase education um, in the United States wine market that um, to teach the customer about that. It's just mm-hmm. hard when you have a shelf with, you know, hundreds of wines. How do you educate the consumer that this wine needs to be enjoyed within four to six hours? Otherwise, it may change. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I actually don't know about this firsthand. I heard about it secondhand. Um, again, repeating what we're talking about in the cellar, but I've heard of you know, some European cafes doing that part of the education, telling their, telling their consumer that you have a window, four to six hours to drink this, yeah. then it's going to change. And the customer, they did a good job as like a caviste or a sommelier mm-hmm. to teach their customer about that. Um, and then it's up to the customer. If they don't want that, they don't have to buy it, you know. Um, it's all so subjective, so. Yeah, yeah, but education can be in, important, I think, in that. I think you're right, and... I mean, three to four hours, it's enough to carry you through most meals if you're, you know, splitting a bottle of wine right. at a cafe. Like, I suppose it's just a little tricky because you know, there are people, you know, maybe they do have just a glass of wine at night and they set the red wine on the table and the, that's how they enjoy wine. Sure. So that consumer should know, like, you know, this, unless you're interested in this, you know, style of wine yeah, it's just going to be aware of, right? Because it's not going to sit well overnight on your table. Mm-hmm. Um, and to have that, yes, that wine, you know, may need, you have plenty of natural wines that last uh, without anything, but there are these, you know, exceptions where you get something developing. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of talk about mass in particular. But yeah, uh, my sulfur use has definitely decreased. I'm not uh, dogmatic around it. And sometimes I question it because, like, I have had these follies where, you know, you send wines out and then then they develop something later. I feel, yeah, the past two vintages, honestly, I don't have a number for you, but probably, like, 90% of the wines were sans souf. Mm. And unless there's a glaring issue, like, that's that's the time and place I see f- fit for it or, like, when you need it. And I'm stealing words from someone else. I can't remember who it was. I think I was watching, like, a youtube video and it's like french winemakers but they're mm. talking about uh sulfur use being medicinal and i feel like people have been saying this okay that's where i first heard about this kind of um this philosophy of it but you don't take medicine for any reason but there's a time and place um mm-hmm. where you know maybe it's an appropriate it's just person to person but for me it's like there's an appropriate time like if yeah and like yeah let's say like during fermentation all of a sudden like holy smokes we are having kind of like a VA issue, like it's, it's coming on fast and hard. Um, you can try and get it off the skins, but that may be a time where, okay, like maybe, you know, 10 parts, nip it in the bud or having malolactic interruptive fermentation. And yeah, like the mallow starts eating the sugars and mm-hmm. spitting out ethyl acetate or, um, or mouse. And, yeah. and it's like, okay, like you can, wines can get sent down a path of, and there's someone out there who's going to embrace them as, as they are, <laughs> But right. um, they, they, things can get pretty bizarre. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and th- that's a time and place I'd add it. Or you know, you rack the wines, and they're just obviously, I say like growing whiskers. You know, yeah. 
though that's a time and place I still will apply it. But yeah, often if things go well, I find there's not a need for it. And then also we were kind of talking about, you know, vineyards that you learn just do well, like that the mm-hmm. Sauvignon Blanc vineyard. I mean, knock on wood, but I just took like huge risk bottling, you know, my largest skew, Sans Souf. You know, we're talking um, 600 cases or something, but it's always been fine. It showed no symptoms. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, yeah, just went for it, you know, because I'm interested in it. A lot of people are. Uh, It's a misnomer that wines can't age without sulfur. Um, And it does, it changes the wine. Like there's no doubt about it. Yeah. And to have a unique product on the marketplace is also of, of value. And I think um, it's just stimulating and interesting. And of course, uh, less preservatives or chemicals in the body is probably good too. Mm-hmm. Um, that being said, like sulfites, our bodies naturally producing them and working with them on their own accord. So true sulfur allergen is fairly rare. But yeah, too much sulfites, definitely not good. And I, I just think it's like awesome that you know, there there is sort of a romantic puritanical pursuit in making as pure a product as possible. You know, mm-hmm. there's kind of the catchphrase like Vent pur, like pure wine. Yeah. Um, French f- phrase. So I personally can't help myself. I guess I pursued it out of interest. Also, you know, being inspired by some of these people in old world countries who have pursued it. And then like what's the goal though? Like there's inherent risk, like why do it? But it's to have a more unique um, product and you know mm-hmm. you sulfur a wine and immediately like it tastes harder more tannic like you lose that juicy quality mm-hmm. um, and so it's interesting p- to pursue it but it comes with risk and yeah. you know like it's not uh, it's not for everyone and I mean I legitimately will lose sleep over these kinds of things but for it's sure. what I do and I'm into it and you know but I'm also yeah. not extremist and uh, I don't hang my hat on it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I like to keep an open mind. I think there's room for everyone. You know, we need the $5 Safeway wines. I, well, maybe we don't, but <laughs> we need, <laughs> we need. you know, somebody wants a you know, $20 bottle and to have a $20 bottle, it's got to be more conventionally made and sadly probably not coming from organic fruit, but not wine is a luxury item. So maybe it's appropriate to have that and then- every shade of gray in between. Yeah. Um, I just have been pursuing more of a artisan style of project and interest. And mm-hmm. so it's taken me down that route. Um, yeah. And it's, uh, I mean, I guess still for the time being, at least it's still, uh, it's just you. So right. it's a, it seems like just kind of a reflection of, uh, well, it's of just- you. There's not like a lot of, a lot of people that you have to, please, as far as like bookkeepers or. <laughs> this is true. Yeah. I mean, you like, of course have to balance your life. I, I And I've been lucky that I've had success with it. Um, you know, I've only had a few outliers where things get kind of like, you know, a little wonky and you you get the feedback, you know, it's just me, but it's also, you know, I produce a decent, I mean, I'm a very small producer, but there's still thousands of bottles going to thousands of customers yes. and yeah. you want your customer to be happy. I mean, the point of wine is enjoyment and pleasure. Um, and so, yeah, you don't want to have something that displeases someone. <laughs> um, it's also, you know, so experiential. Like one person's favorite is going to – another person, they hate it and vice versa, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah, wine is – wine can teach you certain parts about life, you know? <laughs> like not everyone has to like it. Not everyone has to like you. Um, I mean, of course, it's nice to be amicable. You don't want to be <laughs> – a despicable person, but yeah. <laughs> you know, there's all these little philosophical avenues these conversations can take you down. And you were mentioning some people saying maybe like a Sans Souf wine won't age, but we, I mean, we just tasted the Chardonnay that we were trying right. to figure out like how many months it had exactly right. in barrel. And I think you said 42 yeah, or 44 40, and a half or 40, something. 40, yeah, 44 months. So yeah, basically three years and change barrel age Sans Souf. Chardonnay, white wine, Surly. And um, yeah, like no, I mean, we could run the numbers. Maybe there's VA, but like no perceptible volatility, yeah. no mouse, no 
bacterial issues, and it's probably extremely stable because if anything would have happened, you'd assume it would happen here. Mind you, bottling is kind of like a traumatic part in the wine's life. It's going to get transferred into a bottle. Inevitably, you get a little blip of oxygen, um, and we'll see what happens. But um, I think it's stable, and I'm really not worried about it. And yeah, I think, uh, you know, the misnomer of like wines can't age without sulfur, like even a wine with sulfur, eventually the sulfur dioxide degrades. Mm Mm-hmm. And at that point, the wine's aging on its own merits. So any wine kept long enough will really have like a no, well, a no active sulfur dioxide content. Mm-hmm. And then they're aging on their own regard. Maybe it helps start a cleaner slate because, um, you know, it's antimicrobial. Um, but yeah, wines also, conventional wines also age eventually mm-hmm. without basically sulfur protection. Yeah. If that makes sense, you know, because it, it degrades. And right, the sulfur dioxide. I don't know through chemical reactions eventually becomes inert. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it gets all bound up. But also, like I'm also that's why I also pursue it is I'm interested on seeing the wine age on its own merits. Mm-hmm. Um, each vineyard, you know, the fruit, the phenolic content, the tannins, just the the inherent constituents of the the grapes and the juice. The good ones are going to last, and the ones maybe less so. Um, they won't last as long. Yeah. Also, winemaking can influence that whether you know you have um, maceration or not. Um, yeah, just different acidity levels. But again, like that's kind of with the way we make wine. That depends on what you're getting from the vineyard. Mm-hmm. Um, but of course, like good acidities can help aging. Um, but yeah, how the wine naturally quenches oxygen over time is really going to dictate its life its lifespan and uh, i'm more interested in seeing it on its own accord rather than an added preservative yeah can you tell me about some of the vineyards that you work with what what kind of draws you to a vineyard and i know you're you have a lot in the santa cruz mountains and the sort of san, san benito kind of related areas and then up, yeah. up to sonoma and yeah, Santa, Santa, you know. for sure. So I, you know, initially I wanted to work with exclusively Santa Cruz Mountains, but there's not that many vineyards, A, eh? and then unfortunately there's not that many organic vineyards because as crunchy and granola as we all think Santa Cruz is, um, the climate can be challenging to farm organically and a lot of people don't have a tolerance for that. Um, so there's not a ton of organic fruit available and sometimes to get organic fruit, you either have to partner up with a farmer I've, I've done that, you know, with the greens that like, I'll buy all the fruit if we're farming organically Okay. and then, or you farm it yourself. And I've done that and I still farm one small vineyard independently. And then, um, yeah. So Santa Cruz to get organic fruit is a little bit tricky. When I learned that I had to go, I, to go expand a little bit. Sure. So Mendocino was an obvious option. They've got a long history of organic grape growing. Mm-hmm. And so that's where I found my Sauvignon Blanc source, and I made a handful of wines from Mendocino. I've edged away from it a little bit because it is far away. It's actually not – like Hopland's not that far on a straight drive, um, like th- three hours and change. But some of the areas, you know, it's a bigger uh, county, mm-hmm. and it could be four or five hours. And then, you know, you hit traffic coming back, and I mean, it can be a multi-day <laughs> ordeal to get yeah. there, get the fruit back, and process it. So I've – I've gone to more local sources because it is a little bit distant. I still love some of the vineyards up there and for sure I'm going to keep them. Um, But San Benito is a local region that is lesser known in the big picture of California wines. Mm -hmm. It actually has a long history of grape growing and some really, some great vineyards and some organic vineyards out there. So that's been a really uh, promising and an increasingly larger source for me because Santa Cruz is basically finite. um, And then- where else is the fruit going to come from? I went to Mendocino. It was a little far away. Like, what are my other local options? San Benito, uh, mm-hmm. Cienega Valley, and so I'm getting more fruit from there. And then, yeah, what attracts me to a vineyard? Of course, quality of farming. Um, basically, just like health and quality of fruit. Mm-hmm. Uh, you want the grapes to be grown as if part of the landscape, in my ideology, okay. as opposed to being like disjointed from it. How could it be disjointed from it? Excessive irrigation or f- um, fertilizing, like you want like the forest grown strawberry, not the Driscoll strawberry, (laughs) not to troll Driscoll's, but you know what I mean? Like, you know, and you can make those strawberries maybe taste good. You chop them up, put sugar on them overnight, but you want the fruit that is grown with 
inherent flavor and concentration, like a homegrown sure. tomato versus like a Safeway tomato. Mm -hmm. Like we all know that difference. It's a little bit, it's harder to delineate in wine because there's so many processes along the way. But as a winemaker, I want the fruit that inherently has those qualities. Um, yeah. And yeah, it's, I, I don't know, you know it when you taste it. And, you know, I have a spectrum of vineyards. Not everyone's like the fourth strawberry, but a lot of them, I mean, the vineyard I take care of it is because it just <laughs> is pretty much growing wild at this point. Um, but yeah, some of the vineyards might apply a little water because it is California, it's hot. Um, but yeah, I've uh, I've left vineyards because I was like, I'm not sure about this. Like, it mm -hmm. seems like we're just, they're good, but they're not all the way there. Okay. And so um, I've made moves to kind of, trim off the fat and like work with the places I like more. And then, you know, San Benito and Cienega Valley, some of the vineyards there I've been really attracted to because of the soils, mm. basically pure decomposed granite and limestone. In yeah. fact, I still have, oh, I think I got rid of them finally. I had like a bunch of pieces of limestone oh, that, yeah. <laughs> that I had brought back, but they're, they're kind of taking up random space at the winery. <laughs> Um, but these soils, like you hold it like in your hands and it's just like rocks. And yeah. that's pretty cool. Like a lot of California vineyards are on, a little bit blander alluvial loam soils on flatlands, you know? Yeah. Um, and to get fruit off of like true mineral rock soils is I think exciting. And we're talking about like the Viognier and it's like, oh, it seems to have a really good acidity and everybody's scared of Viognier because they think it's going to be flat and low in acid. And I think those soils help retain that acidity. Mm -hmm. And there's very little limestone in California and that's one of the places there is limestone. Yeah, people have really gone on the search for it in the past. Yeah, I mean, I, it's easy. This uh, Jamelli Vineyard I'm working quite a bit with and is basically, I don't know if the pro the property borders it, but it borders Clara, which mm, is mm -hmm. where um, Josh Jensen, if yeah, I'm getting Josh it right. Jensen, Josh yeah. Jensen, he yeah. literally went to Burgundy. He's like Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, limestone soils. Where's the limestone in California? Mount Harlan, kind of the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and like, that's where he set up shop, you know? Yeah. Like, for that, basically one reason, these soils are basically, those are the soils. Mm -hmm. um, they're neighboring property pretty much. They're not exactly the same, of course. There's a lot more decomposed granite uh, where I'm sourcing, but yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, tell me about the vineyard that you're farming. Uh, Blue Jay Vineyard, yeah. It is a vineyard, an old Rudon Smith vineyard from the mm. 1970s. And it was, I, I think, I think if I have the history right, it was first ever planted to Riesling, then switched over Chardonnay. Okay. And so it's an old 70s planted Chardonnay vineyard. Um, over the years and different managements, it's a bit derelict and patchy. So I've begun to replant a little bit. I planted an acre of Gamay and then 500 vines, maybe half an acre of Savignon. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's still kind of the wild feral vines okay. of Chardonnay. There's some Pinot. Uh, that was grafted a couple of random Riesling vines, which I think probably grew back hmm. from like roots okay. of like vines that were removed and the shard was put in. I assume, unless that was like random budwood that got mixed into the Chardonnay, I'm yeah. not sure. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a labor of love. It's hard to farm. Um, I'm limited by equipment and manpower. There, <laughs> There's a tractor, but really no... Uh, um, implements for it okay. i've got like a rotary mower but i have to do like under for undervine management we weed whack i spray by hand um yeah so it's it's the gophers like there's i got deer damage this year it's difficult yeah. to farm it's on a slope um you know i probably lost 10 to 20 percent from gophers just yeah, wow chewing at the baby vines yeah um, and that's like really disappointing. Even like three, four years in, it's like you've got this vine that's ready to produce and then you come and the leaves are drooping and a, a gopher's chewed through the trunk and just took out that vine. You're like, okay, there's four years and all that work. That's been difficult, you know? Um, but it's still exciting to be doing it. And again, if anything, it just keeps my hands dirty and continues mm -hmm. my education and get to see that full cycle full circle, full cycle story of winemaking, sure. which, which I think is it's sort of the pinnacle and the dream is to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so although it's small, um, it's not that small, but it, I mean, it, it's small in the big picture. Um, I think it's an important thing to keep doing. Yeah. It sounds like it is kind of a labor, well, of, a labor love of love. And, I mean, and like, and, look, I, I, I probably had rose colored sunglasses on and a bushy tail and bright eyes, <laughs> but 
<laughs> when I, you know, when I planted, did I really think about trying to maintain something for probably four plus years to get it to maturity to get, and then plus a year of winemaking to make any return on it? Yeah. I didn't totally take that into account. So can't say that's how, um, definitely not how I make money, but, uh, yeah, it's sort of a continued education, labor of love at this point. But we are going to hopefully get some production this year. And, you yeah. know, I did get fruit off it last year. And, yeah, there could be maybe a break-even point at this point. Mm -hmm. Those first couple years, though, is definitely an investment of whether it's, you know, sweat equity, just going yeah. out there and doing the work yourself or, um, yeah, really. What was kind but, of the status of it when you took it over? Had it been kind it, of a it, it was in decline and, yeah okay. it, it just every year the, the owner was like every year it kind of you know the yields have gone down every year i think uh sometimes there's a point probably through the neglect and stuff and like disease creeping in wood diseases and stuff um it just got to the point of sort of it's just not doing well it was at the point of probably needing replanting it wasn't established to last 100 years and mm -hmm. the care wasn't there to last 100 years so it was kind of it was already in that state, you yeah. know, and then the vines that are still there and like thriving and happy, there's those kind of outliers that are just like, they're happy no matter what, as long as you prune them. Sure. But a lot of the vineyard needs to be basically redone. Okay. Uh, and yeah, that's kind of a big question. I've done like a portion of it and it's like, oh, geez, do I continue it? Because again, that um, investment and it's not my own property, mm -hmm. you know, you could lose it on a day's notice. Sure. The the relationship's really great. That's why I'm still out there. The family who owns it, really sweet people. They like what I'm doing and they have no intentions of selling the property, but that's something that could happen, right? They're like, we're selling the property. The next person's like, I'm pulling it out and putting in a dirt bike track. You yeah. know? And then, okay, so then it's gone. Mm -hmm. So it's been, that's a difficult decision. I'm not, just, I don't have the perfect answer for like what to do with it. I've thought about like, you know, going full board, and just trying to get the investment and do it, you know, just mm -hmm. get it right. And honestly, maybe... I don't know. I wasn't ready to do that three, four years ago. So, but that would have been nice to do. <laughs> just, you know, get it done, yeah. get it done right. Just reset and do it right. Um, at this point, it's just kind of doing what I can and keeping that portion happy and healthy mm -hmm. um, and trying to just keep what I can manage without, yeah, overextending myself. Yeah. You know, I wanted to ask you about a couple of the, couple of wines you make and mainly, I guess, maybe Chardonnay and Pinot mm. where you, you've been making them both for a it's while from now. From inception, yeah. And they're not really the most popular Commercial, wines like in, wine. in, in, for the yeah. natural wine community. Like yeah. They, um, but you, you've been making them from inception and you've stuck with them and they're really great wines. But I guess my question is, uh, what made you start with Chardonnay and Pinot? Yeah, uh, this is something I tell people a little bit often, but I'm definitely subject of the time period I got into wine. Okay. And, uh, you know, when I got into wine in 2009, um, I feel maybe, I, I can't put a time marker on it, but the past 30 years, Pinot and Chardonnay have sort of been in the limelight. If we go mm -hmm. further, I sort of, you know, like my generation, probably your generation, I feel like, that's what was hot was like Pinot and Chard. If we go yeah. a generation above us to my m mom and dad's generation, I guess like, you know, maybe like early, if like from now 2020s to like 1990s, Pinot and Chard were popular. If you go further back, like early 90s, 80s, 70s, Bordeaux and Napa Cab was king. Mm -hmm. So if I was, you know, if I when if I got into it in the 80s, I'd probably be a Cabernet winemaker, yeah. like not okay. gonna lie, you know? <laughs> it's just when I got into it, that's what was really interesting. Yeah. And that's what I pursued for my kind of education and career too, you know, working in Bergen. Also, I mean, it just, by chance, that's where I started out. You know, that's where the introduction to winemaking class in Burgundy, yeah. France, Pinot. And so that's that's where the hook was set. Yeah. Um, had it have been, you know, Italy, uh, maybe I would have been more interested in Italian varieties. Um, but that's pretty much why I pursued Pinot Noir and Chardonnay so much. And that is where the most intensity of like my winemaking education went. Mm -hmm. um, things kind of changed as I pursued natural winemakings and, and different styles. And, you know, how do you make a charming, seductive wine that has personality that nobody, no one else's wines have? Mm -hmm. um, 
it changed the path a little bit. It became less about like, oh, how do I make a reductive Chardonnay to like, oh, how do you like coax out the charm, you know? Mm. Um, but again, time period and like the evolution of my my thinking and my winemaking. Um, but yeah, still love Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. And uh, I, you know, everyone will still want to drink it if it's good. So yeah. it's just the way it goes. Yeah, yeah, the first three wines I made were uh, the Chardonnay, Grenache, and Pinot Noir, all sort of fascination varieties for me. All have been known to make exceptional wines, um, and that's where I started. And I guess kind of your your home turf here, Santa Cruz Mountains, have been sure. known to make some pretty amazing Pinot and yeah. Chardonnay for can't a long escape, time. Can't escape that either by virtue of being in the Santa Cruz Mountains and those being championed varieties. That's also where the small accessibility you have, that's what's out there. Yeah. So. And it seems like Grenache is another one that's kind of close to your – Heart. Grenache is close to my heart, and it's also one of the ones where I've been bumped around the most. Like, it's probably the one I've worked with the most vineyards but, um, because, yeah, okay. you know, gain something, lose something. Uh, I think it, being a young Negos winemaker, you might gain a vineyard only to lose it the next year. Sometimes that's difficult. And Grenache, and I guess my my goal, my ideal, you want to be able to tell – a wine story over time, mm -hmm. you know, it's nice to have a vertical and be like, let's see how this wine is like each year and how it ages. And that's, I think, really interesting. And if you had a property, that would be the story. But um, being a newer project, that's not the case. So I've, I've worked with a lot of different Grenache vineyards. What's been great about that though, is to just see how terroir oriented Grenache is. Mm. Every single vineyard, dramatically different expression. I mean, almost more than, I, I want to say almost more than, Pinot Noir. Okay. I think maybe more. Like every single vineyard I've worked with that's Grenache based is like tremendously different. And I think that's super cool. So it's still um, a high pursuit of mine. Okay. I haven't found the Holy Grail yet, but um, it's out there. And yeah, Grenache is super fun to work with. Challenging too. Sensitive to oxygen. Um, and yeah, to make a great wine, a little bit elusive, but mm. yes. Yeah, when we were tasting, you were saying that you thought maybe it takes about three years or so until you really get the yeah, handle like on the vineyard mm -hmm. and really kind of develop a, a style for it. Yeah, when I first start working with the vineyard, the first year you, you make the best decisions you can and then you have a wine and you're like, then you can start to play with the variables. You know, maybe I picked a little too early, seems a little sour and hard, or maybe I picked a little too late, needs some more acidity. Then you make that adjustment the next year. And then, you know, you see how that helped change or develop the wine. And then by that third year, I feel like there's a pretty good idea of sweet spotting mm. ripenesses. I maybe also will dabble with different technique, you know, fully whole cluster. Oh, that was like way too tannic. <laughs> maybe we should dial back on that. Um, and I guess you can sometimes try other people's wines, but who have already worked with the vineyard mm -hmm. to cue into things, but they're not always available. Or maybe the style is just so dramatically different, you can't even um, decipher from it. So until you have that firsthand experience, yeah, I feel three years of working with a vineyard is when I find my footing of how I'd like to work with it. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes things, I mean, they're, they're typically always good, but just dialing in your personal preference for it, I think takes about three years mm -hmm. for myself. And you've made, I guess, over the year, well, you do like a Santa Cruz Chardonnay as well as the Sonoma Mountain Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. And I, I think a couple of years maybe you've made uh, like multiple Syrahs a, yeah. a year. And you like doing a couple of the same variety to kind of see the terroir differences. Yes, yeah, the hell-bent winemaker in me only making my job more difficult. <laughs> but, um, yeah, fascinated by the concept of terroir. Like that's how those wines got developed. Santa Cruz Mountains compared to Sonoma Mountain. Like what are, let's look at the differences. The Syrahs, like both Santa Cruz Mountains, Syrahs, you know, the, the pragmatic decision would be blend them, make one wine. But I wanted to look at the differences and they're very different, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that's really awesome to highlight that being said, you know, you go to your distributor and you're like, hey, I've got, you know, 18 <laughs> different <laughs> wines or, you know, I've got more than, I've got over 20 different wines probably. And it becomes, it starts to become a little bit of a challenge to manage mm -hmm. um, just on the inventory and your own, you know, your your brain keeping track of the garage, you know, where is everything and making sure everything's being cared for. Um, yeah. 
but I am really interested in that concept. And if I could make every single one singular, I would. Sometimes I, I do put things together because sometimes they complement one another too. Mm-hmm. Um, but I definitely love that terroir study. And I think if you are, as we are, kind of cerebral wine, um, I don't want to call us wine nerds, but <laughs> wine lovers, like those are really fun studies to look at. In yeah. fact, when I taste, you know, or even going out, like, it's always nice to have more than one glass on the table mm. to have, um, cause not that you desensitize to it, but like you adjust to the glass you're having. But if you mm-hmm. have something else on the table, you can uh, have a reference and cross compare, yeah. and, like reawaken your senses. Mm. And so, yeah, when I'm tasting or drinking wine, I, I feel like there's always more than one thing open or more than one glass. And even if you're out with like your partner or something, like each person gets something different and you can share and see the differences. Mm-hmm. Sometimes same variety, sometimes totally different. You know, somebody wants a white, somebody wants a red, but I love that cross analysis because mm-hmm. it helps to understand too. If you only drunk one thing your whole life, that's all you're going to understand and know. But to develop a memory bank of smells and aromas and wines and characters, you have to taste the rainbow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the two Syrahs, for example, were they from different sides of sort of the Santa Cruz mountains or were they closer together and just different exposures? Or Yes. Yeah, so the two Syrahs, what's the difference in the vineyards? Um, both were small parcels, one more above uh, Soquel in Santa Cruz, Okay. more in the Redwoods, a little, let's see, if am I doing that? Yeah, a little closer to the ocean as the crow mm-hmm. flies like three miles from the ocean. So slightly cooler, kind of amongst the redwoods. The other Sorrel Vineyard was more, honestly, above like the town of Santa Cruz, mm. kind of going towards Scotts Valley. Okay. A little warmer, um, but probably similar soils. A lot of the Santa Cruz soils are uh, sandy. Hmm. There's a lot of sandstone or mudstone. And so you get these well-drained sandy soils. Okay. So the soils, I didn't hyper-analyze them, but I'd say probably similar soil type. What's, I think, dictating these wines more is probably climactic. Okay. And then of course it's, you know, there's so many variables in wine. Clonal selection, I don't know what the clonal selection is for both these straws, but that can also impact a wine quite a bit. Sure. But yeah, climactic is probably the big difference. Are you still making the free solo blend? That wine I've made, that's actually um, a wine I've made since 2018. So actually it's one of the wines I've made from the same vineyard the longest. So I've done 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, and soon to be 24. So We'll have seven vintages from the same vineyard. And that's Very just cool. a tiny little parcel off of near San Martin. Mm. And mm-hmm. it's an old vine field blend um, planted probably 1920 or so. I don't have the exact year, uh, five generation Italian family. Yeah. So cool, long history, old vines. Um, yeah, it's just cool to have like a vertical. I'd like to do a dinner actually now that I have five vintages to pull corks on and do like a dinner and do a vertical. What kind of drew you to that vineyard? It seems like a different sort of style than some of the other wines, at least maybe not in the winemaking, but just in the, um, so many of your wines are kind of single, single variety. Yeah. Um, I typically, if I have any, uh, focus, I've tried to stick with just French varieties and even at that largely, you know, Eastern French varieties, Burgundy, Rhone, well, Loire's not exactly Eastern, but um, I guess I've steered, I've, well, now I can't say that anymore. I've stuck to French varieties, but now I've done board, I've done so many French varieties (laughs) now, but uh, I haven't really dabbled in Italians and stuff. That being said, what attracted me to the old vine field blend was having something uniquely Californian. Mm. Um, You know, this is what people were planning a hundred years ago, all the immigrants and settlers, whether it's Portuguese, Italians, Germans, Swiss, I mean, all the Europe or many of the European people who loved wine were bringing vines with them. Um, we, I, I should actually do more research on the history of like how the, uh, the field blend got so popularized, like the Zen, Mouved, Carignan, Petit Syrah, mm-hmm. Alicante Boucher, this, this style of field blending that's so prevalent in old vines of California. Mm-hmm. Um, and then why they were doing it, you know, there's the philosophy that all the different varieties contribute something to the wine and you get a more complete wine. There's also the theory that, you know, if one grape does well one vintage, but another doesn't, you always have wine each year. Mm -hmm. Um, But how that particular set of grapes became so popular, I'm less knowledgeable about. Um, But yeah, yeah, I was attracted to the history of the wine. 
And I, it was probably actually, I'd worked at Bedrock in 2015 mm. and that uh, helped in, with my appreciation and love for like old vine, California heritage wines yeah. or heirloom wines. Actually, yeah, Morgan Twain Peterson tried to call them heirloom wines. And I think the TTB said you can't do that or something. Okay. okay. Yeah, um, I think they're heritage wines I think now. now. I think they let you say, I put that on the bottle. You can put, like put heritage varieties okay. or heritage yeah. vineyard. And they've got like the old vine society and all that. Yeah. And those blends, they kind of change as you get to the different areas right. also. So this, it's this interesting, vineyard, you know, yeah, sometimes, you get... sometimes they're like 90% Zen or like 95% Zen and Alicante Beche. This vineyard's probably like 50% Zen, but then next as much Mouvet actually. Okay. Um, and then you've got all the other schmatterings of things, including like Black Moose Scat. Not a lot of it, but it's out there. How, yeah. I don't know why, but... Um, Actually, I mean, probably because it's like the snack grape, you know, in the vineyard. Yeah. Because it's delicious. <laughs> um, and that vineyard, it used to be bigger. It used to be like 18 contiguous acres, but it predates the 101. So when they built the 101, they had to pull out a lot of it. Okay. Um, and what's left is just kind of, it's almost like a vine garden connected to the owner's home. Got and it. only produces two to three barrels of wine a year. Okay. So it's pretty small production. Yeah. My family had most of their ranch taken by the 101. Oh, no. Also. Yeah. Uh, just up the road from there in, in San Jose. But yeah, the, the 101 definitely took out some, yeah, I don't really some know. old ranches. Yeah, when I don't, it, when I don't it got really built. know how those agreements worked. I'm sure they bought people out or something, but it, at some point, I'm sure there was some unfairness and just it's coming through the railroad tracks. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I think you it was move a over. lot of eminent domain and, right. you know. People not feeling like they got the amount of money that they oh, should have sure. you know, for the for the property. Yeah. But, um, you know, I meant to ask you earlier, but what what sort of drew you back to Santa Cruz after? Yeah, growing up yeah. in Davis and then traveling. yeah, yeah. I joke that I'm like a baby sea turtle swimming back to the beach. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, I think it is like lifestyle to a degree, and also the fact that my job was here. You mm -hmm. know. Um, the, that combination of factors, sort of being able to, you know, surf and play and scooter around town and go see a music show and then be in the vineyard, you know, same day. Mm -hmm. It's pretty cool. Also, what attracted me to it, though, was more strictly, actually, you know, now I think about it, maybe more than lifestyle. I was like so dedicated to my pursuit of wine at the time mm -hmm. that I um, I thought it was like a unique place to make wine. I thought that the the fruit that was coming out of the Santa Cruz mountains was kind of standalone in California. Mm -hmm. And I think it's having a little bit of a notoriety right now, people realizing that, you know, the fruit coming from the redwood forest has, it's different than so much of just the sunburned hills of California. And, you know, at the time, a lot of inspiring names, whether it was, you know, Sarah Toss or Arnold Roberts, or then there's just the classic torch bears of the Santa Cruz mountains, you know, sure. uh, Ridge, Mount Eden, this possibility of quality, great wines, distinctive wines mm -hmm. in a cooler climate. Although that's a little deceiving because Santa Cruz mountains is fairly big and like the more San Jose side or like getting to the San Jose Valley at altitude, like Saratoga, um, it's warmer, you know, they've got Cabernet out there, but then yeah. coming over to the coastal side, it's all Santa Cruz mountains, AV, AVA. But then you really get into this like socked in with fog and the redwoods and mm -hmm. different f different expression. So it's not like broken up into micro parcels, but I think in general it's a unique place to be growing grapes. And if you zoom out on the you know on Google Maps, it's like Santa Cruz is very much a green pocket. But you're right though; the area does has a certain sprawl mm. to it and a lot of different areas. Inf like and, infinite and, microclimates. Like, yeah. yeah, it could be. Yeah, I mean, you could probably be in 105 degree weather, and if you got down to the coast, it could be. 55 you know? <laughs> yeah yeah it is cool and i think it's it's had some great grape growing for a long time yeah i i need to brush up on my history but i've heard that um when they were logging the redwoods and stuff and the italians and portuguese were out here that a lot of the san francisco wine was coming from um, the Santa Cruz mountains at one point, like not Sonoma, not Napa, because Napa was growing prunes, you know, and fruits and vegetables. And actually I, a lot of wine was coming from Santa Cruz mountains. That being said, I think the Santa Cruz mountains is the forest and the forest wants to take things back. So a lot of those <laughs> vineyards just got consumed by the forest again and they got lost and it just never developed the, the infrastructure that Napa, Sonoma, Paso has. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And I'd like to learn more about that myself, just how much wine was coming out of the mountains, going to San Francisco, the city. Yeah, I mean, that Saratoga side was like Saratoga, Cupertino. Right. I mean, there was, there was a lot from there. Yeah. Gilroy, all, which I know it's not really Santa Cruz mountains, but a lot from there also. And I think there was a, a large amount from from the Santa Cruz mountains, from certain areas. Mm -hmm. People have known it, it's a good area to grow grapes for a really long time, but it's also, it's mountainous right. and foresty and- For sure the just air ability, the farm ability of the yeah. land is actually challenging. Mm -hmm. um, tractors, equipments, all that on slopes, it is harder. Um, and then yeah, the forest always wanting to grow through it again, yeah. having to maintain. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask a question about, I, I, I see it in a lot of your, your writing and everything, but you say dedicated to elemental practices. Uh -huh. What does that mean to you? Um, that, that was just like a little, uh, catchphrase about, you know, working with natural practices, mm -hmm. um, you know, working, you know, without artifice, sticking, sticking to the basics, working s simply working mm -hmm. elementally, um, I guess. Yeah, you know, low intervention, minimalist winemaking, or all the way, you know, fringe, zero, zero natural winemaking mm -hmm. kind of encompasses not using fancy or excessive technology in the process, yeah. enzymes, nutrients, all that. Um, I think it was just like a little heartfelt notion to the pursuit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. It has like a certain ring to it. I just thought I'd uh, ask about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, you got a lot of new glass today. Uh -huh. So can you tell me some of the things you're, you're bottling. Yeah. So going into summer bottling, um, we had a chance to taste, uh, as we, as our friend stopped by to pick up some stuff with a forklift. <laughs> um, but I've got three Chardonnays. I've got 2023 Peg Legs Sonoma Mountain Chardonnay. I've got a longer Elevage 2022 Santa Cruz Mountain Chardonnay, um, which will be the moon milk. And then I've got, a extended Elevage <laughs> 2020 um, Santa Cruz Mountain Chardonnay. So yeah, that was the one we were talking about earlier, some 44 months in, in barrel. A little bit of an experimental, yeah, a little bit experimental, just see what that extra long Elevage does. Yeah, I've heard of certain characters developing and I also want to try it with Grenache. I was like, you know, trying to practice my French reading old French book. Hmm. Um, and they were talking about like a Rancio character that only develops after like two years. So okay. I'll, I'll have to get to that eventually. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I, I get these like little ideas and I have to play with them. So that's the extra long Elevage Chardonnay. And then I've got the Gamay. That's new for me. Um, that's going to be called Fat Cat Loves Nene. Okay. <laughs> <A> little teaser. <laughs> um, and then I've got the Grenache. That'll be the Pope Smoke Grenache 23. And uh, the Violet Vista Bordeaux Blend. Um and a 2022, the Noble Oval Pinot Noir, also, okay. you know, eight, 18 months in barrel. So trying to over vintage things a little more now that mm -hmm. I can for select wines. Yeah. And we, we haven't tasted that one yet, but we will. I'm pretty excited about it. I think it turned out nicely. Yeah. I don't know if there's anything I, you think I missed or that, like you'd love to talk about. Um... Not particularly. I mean, I guess it's just going to be interesting to watch wine and natural wine evolve over over time in the in the states you know mm -hmm. i think people have been talking about a reckoning moment with natural wine you know and I, there, there's something there's currents in the water i don't know what they are you know i just you know try and do what i'm interested in but you know i make my product it goes out to the people and you get feedback on it and um i'm curious where it's going you know mm. i think some people have started to want you know, cleaner wines. Um, okay. I think what I'm known for though a little bit is, you know, having achieved for the for the large part, like clean wines made naturally. Mm -hmm. um, so I haven't been too worried about that. I have my outliers. Yeah. But, um, but I think, you know, people want it all, you know? Yeah. People are asking for it. Can it be cheaper? People are asking for, you know, organic, which of course we do, but it's like they want cheaper and organic and clean and natural. And it's like, you know, <laughs> can you get every single thing in one package? Sometimes you can, but people are demanding for a lot. Um, 
And then it's like, okay, so they put demands on, you know, you want the wine to be natural wine. And then it's like, okay, maybe someone would have been more experimental, but now they're like more fearful and like, okay, we can't sell it. We better start sulfuring everything, mm. you know? But you also can't have a product that just people aren't enjoying out there. Um, and yeah, I don't, I'm going nowhere with this besides just talking about the fact that there is something going on, yeah. you know, out there with natural wine. I don't, I can't put my finger on it. I can't tell anyone what to do with their winemaking <laughs> or normal, or I can tell myself what to do, but um, yeah, like I, I don't, when people, when I hear some of these like market demands, I mm. personally don't like bowing down to them. It's like, no, I'm not like going to just lower prices. Like it's not going to work. You know, you're, yeah. people are asking for a lot right now. Um, and I actually like to think we're delivering a lot. Um, I think the value of our product is actually really strong. I guess it's good to be confident in a few things, but I think uh, and I think there's been a response for that too. You know, I haven't, mm -hmm. things continue to go pretty well for me out there. Uh, the excitement around the wines and that feels good, you know? Yeah. So I think just sticking to your guns, but I'm curious where things go because people want it all right now and there's something going on out there. Yeah. And just where, where it's all going to go. And I mean, any, anything like that, it requires a bit of a lead time. Also, it's not, yeah. it's not an overnight thing. Mm. You can't just cut like 30% off the, the, pr the price of something. Yeah. Or, you know, like you need to either find cheaper fruit or different area or. But I think that's like. That need it's, to, yeah. Other changes. You don't want to race to the bottom either, like yeah. cheaper fruit. So you start working with a higher production vineyard. I think that's a folly too. Yeah. I mean. Well, I speak for myself, but it's just kind of like stay the course. If anything, actually, for me, I guess one thing I'll be doing is kind of refocusing. Like I've made a lot of SKUs and mm. it's been great for just experiencing loads of different varieties and different winemaking styles. But again, I think I mentioned this earlier a little bit. Um, maybe it's a little too many things. And so I want to focus on my best pieces and kind of trim off a few SKUs this year okay. so I can really focus again. Um always maintained everything to a high level, but maybe at the, at the, uh, the detriment of just like over expenditure of myself, sure. I want to hone back the interest and focus and nail them, you know? Yeah. Um, what's the best place for people to get your wines? I know you, you kind of have a wine club of some, <laughs> some sort of, ish, um, uh, yeah. or I, I, I do have a little thing. Yeah. Signing up for, our newsletter is great. I promise you will not be spammed because you're lucky to get an email from me once a year. <laughs> um, that being said, it's on the docket to try and improve that. We, I say we, I'm my colleague Nick Dazi who helps me out um, and myself, I'm hoping to get a wine club going and make the availability from the winery a little better uh, so people can get the wines directly from us. That being said, even out there in the world, so many great places have it. Um, you know, special, you probably, some specialty grocers will have it, but you won't find us in generic stores. Look for the small specialty natural wine merchants or organic food shops um, in the Bay Area. Farm Wines distributes our wines in California, Jenny and Francois in New York, anybody who's working with those books. Um, we're working with a handful of other states. I just mentioned those two because they're the big ones. Yeah. That's, but yeah, signing up for the newsletter, I'd appreciate it. And hopefully I get that wine club going. You guys can get some more wine from us. <laughs> and uh, yeah, anything, uh, anything you're excited for, for the 2024 harvest? Sort of what I was getting to a second ago, yeah. just like the refocusing, mm -hmm. you know, I think I got spread thin just for myself, like, okay. the, you know, keeping all the balls in the air. You know, I can't let everything's treated pretty much with as much care as any of the other ones. Um, but I want to just refocus and keep dialing it in and then probably continue to do some uh, traveling, go get inspired. I went to France last year. I couldn't fit it in this year. Um, and it doesn't have to be, you know, France, but I really would love to go to Italy. I just want to mm. go to Sicily and eat seafood okay. <laughs> and drink <laughs> wine. Um, but yeah, keep inspired and refocus, I think, yeah. are my goals. And also keep exploring sort of the fringe, you know, taking risks is risk taking. You know, I have things that wind up not perfect, but I also have things that turn out unique because of it. And mm -hmm. again, like trying to coax out those special characters, I, I think that's what keeps me inspired. Continuing learning and continuing striving, yeah. really. 
Yeah, that's what I'm going for in 2024. Stay inspired, keep striving, keep climbing, you know, onwards and upwards. Thanks for listening to my conversation with James. He's making some really great wines from wonderful fruit. The Sauvignon Blanc, Santa Cruz Chardonnay, and Pinot Noir, Grenache, and Gamay are some of my favorites. They're all well worth tracking down. You can sometimes find them at floreswines.com, but your local natural wine shop most likely has them also. You can follow them at Flores Wines on Instagram. You can follow the podcast on wherever you're listening and the Instagram at Indie Wine Podcast. And feel free to email IndieWinePodcast at gmail.com with comments, questions, or feedback. If you could tell your wine friends about the podcast too and help spread the word, I'd really appreciate it. Rating or subscribing helps too. There's also a Patreon if you choose to support the podcast monetarily to allow for more episodes and to help defray other costs like gas money and travel and research book purchases. Any amount is appreciated. I have a small token of my appreciation to send to you also if you do. The link is in the show notes. We'll be back soon with another episode. Have a good one.